Good morning, everybody. So I come from a marketing perspective. That's what I do. Yet some of the things that Lebo talked about actually resonate with me. It's also the way that marketing is evaluated often is very short term rather than thinking about long term brand building effects. And when I was queuing to get into to register um, for this event yesterday, I was standing in the line next door to a lady, and uh, I said, I, I, you know, I'm not, really a, I'm not really part of this group. I'm from marketing. And she said, we're all from marketing as well, because that's what we do. So thank you, Camden Hoffman, for saying that, because you made me feel very comfortable about what I'm going to be talking about. So marketing. It, you know, there's many definitions of it, and uh, the one I use is not one which is commonly used, because so many of them are about meeting consumer needs, uh, for profit. Um, and the way I like to think about it is that marketing is the creation, management, and measurement of programs designed to influence the choices that a program, organization, or society needs people to make in order for it to achieve its goals. And I think that's a, an interesting definition for a broader group just than businesses. Because all organizations have goals. Whether you are a trade union leader, whether you are um, a big company like Unilever or Nestle, or whether you're trying to increase rates of male circumcision. You have goals and you need people to make the choices that align with those goals and help you achieve them. And um, the only way you can do that, the only way you can get people to make those choices is to align them with human nature. In one of the, um, the comms talks yesterday, um, Jess, who was talking about um, her project um, called Ninja, I think, said we try to go with the grain of culture, not against the grain of culture. That's a really important insight. And I think it's really important for all of us not to just go with the grain of culture, but also go with the grain of human nature, not against it, because you will not achieve behavior change if you go against the grain of human nature. The good thing is that, um, from my perspective, if uh, I believe that marketing is about choice, today we understand more about choice than ever before. We have. We're really fortunate that we live in a golden age of decision sciences. Um, there are many people who've kind of really changed how we think about how people make choices, showing us that the rational and deliberation, deliberative parts of how we, how we decide are much less important than our intuitions. Baba Shiv, who's been a great inspiration to me, he's a professor at Stanford, talks about how our rational brain simply rationalizes what our intuitive brain has already decided to do. And it's a kind of interesting thought that really sort of our intuitions set the agenda of our choices and then we post-rationalize. The science fiction writer Robert Heinlein used to say, man is not a rational animal, but a rationalizing animal. We also have, um, you know, kind of uh, one of the things that David talked about yesterday was the work of people like David, Daniel Kahneman, who, who sort of talks about system one and system two and the intuitive system of how we make choices. And one of the things Kahneman says in Thinking Fast and Slow is the intuitive system is more influential than your experience tells you and is the secret author of many of the choices that we make. And kind of understanding that secret author is really important for any of us who are involved in influencing choice in any way. One big area, one big very topical area that you will know about, you will have heard about, you will be perhaps working out how to apply that looks at this is behavioral economics. It's kind of a scary title to me because I don't know very much about economics. I, I come from a marketing background. But what's kind of interesting about it is I don't think it's got that much in terms of marketing to do with economics. It's an area of psychology that explores how humans behave and make choices by studying the differences between how we should act from a rational economic perspective and how we actually really behave. And, and that gap, in that gap, we actually get great insights into human nature which is what makes it useful to marketers. But it's not, without, it's not a pill that should be taken without some caution. There's a couple of things, I think, to remember about behavioral economics. One is that uh, Hazel Marcus, who is a professor at Stanford, she talks about weird. It's not that Hazel Marcus is weird, but what she means is that much of the research in behavioral economics is done amongst Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic subjects, or subjects from those countries. And of course, that gives a certain inflection on the things that we see. Now, that is changing. When I started going to conferences about decision making about a decade ago, most of the research was coming, was done at American universities. But now I see an increasing amount coming from universities around the world. 
I think another thing about um, behavioral economics is, from my perspective, I don't see this as rules or empirical evidence that things will work or silver bullets. I see it much more as silver buckshot, as insights to trigger transformation. I think that's a really important thing. It's not sort of science to validate, as you were talking about, Labo, earlier on. It's much more science to inspire and to lead us, because the great solutions that people like you come up with and the lesser solutions that marketers like me come up with are all powered by creativity. And I see these insights as a way of powering creativity. I think another thing as well is that um, also the language of behavioral economics sometimes kind of, well, when the, His Excellency the Minister of Health was talking at the uh, opening ceremony last night, he talked about how we should never talk down to people, and he's absolutely right. And I think some of the language of behavioral economics might seem sometimes that we're doing that. Um, Amos Tversky, who was Daniel Kahneman's research partner, used to say that his colleagues study artificial intelligence, but he studies natural stupidity. Now, that's not really the way it is, but you kind of get some of this language. D um, Daniel Ar Dan Ariely, who wrote the fantastic book, Predictably Irrational. I mean, even the title of that book, to me, sounds like an old married couple having an argument. Oh, you're so predictable. You're so irrational. It's sort of, you know, <laughs> it's not really sort of perhaps dealing with the human spirit in the best possible way. And I think it's really important for us to do that. For, so for me, really, what behavioral economics is about is about insights into human nature. You know, choice is a complicated thing, and I think there's many factors that build towards the choices we make. One is the really important area of culture and societal context. Different cultures and different societies have a different impact on the way people make choices. Another is situational context. A lot of research shows that if you put people in a situation where they're stressed or they're in a hurry, they will make entirely different decisions from the ones that they would make if they're not in those situations. A third is individual differences. This is really important, yet not necessarily kind of in, in a lot of behavioral economics research. Um, but really sort of understanding that sort of people's life history will drive them to or will lead them to make different choices and diff different decision-making strategies. Or indeed, um, genetic differences do that as well. But what I want to talk about today really is how human nature, which washes over all of these things, drives our choices and what behavioral economics reveals about that. I'm going to talk quickly about two principles that sort of came out of, um, of this, this area. But first of all, I was inspired yesterday by Kumi, who talked about how we all had come from Africa. I think that's really important to sort of actually take a step back, because this is not to understand human nature and how people make choices is not just to look at the research which has come out in the last 20 years, is not to just be informed by neuroscience, but to actually understand how our decision-making systems have evolved. And one of the things I always say to my clients is that to understand how people will, will, will uh, what they will behave in the next six months, you need to really understand what they've been doing for the last 200,000 years. Because the intuitions, we talked earlier on about how intuitions drive our choices. And these intuitions are evolved capacities. They're not things that have just sprung up in us individually in our lifetime. They are things that we've inherited over many, many years. One way I think of demonstrating this is, I think, an example that Vlad Vyskovicius, who's a professor at the University of Minnesota, gives, which is to look at America's biggest phobia. And he, um, he talks about research from Gallup polls from 1937 to 2007, from polls from YouGov in 2014, where he, which asked people, what was their biggest phobia in America? Anybody want to take a guess as to what it might have been? People say public speaking sometimes. Uh, people say terrorism. Actually, in these, in these results, it was this, snakes. <laughs> now, not many people in America get killed by snake bites. Granted, it may be a few more than it is in Ireland, where I'm from. But actually, in 2014, it was two, and that was twice as many as have been killed in the previous two years. Yet still intuitively, it's a real sign of danger to us. Our intuitions respond to snakes. Now, cars killed about 40,000 people in the United States in 2014, yet that figures nowhere on people's lists of phobias. So it's kind of interesting. These intuitions we have, they're kind of very deep-seated, and they really do come from our history. We are, I think, it's always interesting to think that sort of the reason we're all here, you, me, everyone, is because we're the product of a long string of choices that were right more often than they were wrong. Our ancestors, their ancestors, their ancestors before them actually managed to make the right choices in hostile and difficult situations and survive and thrive and reproduce. And the intuitions that drove those choices then actually are still the bedrock of many of the choices we make today. 
I suppose a good question is what drives these choices? And the answer is mental, quick and efficient mental shortcuts. Quick so you can make decisions very quickly, and efficient so you can do them without expending too much energy. And these really are sort of, these are known as heuristics. But shortcuts are deep in human nature. The picture I'm going to show you now, I think, tells me more about human nature than any other picture I've seen, which is this. <laughs> you know, the people who've carved that path, taking the shortcut, are probably saving themselves about three seconds of time, about one yard or one meter of walking, and about 0 0.035 of calories. But people still do it. We're drawn to take shortcuts. And as I said, it has served us very, very well over the history of human beings. Now, that's a good analogy for a heuristic, a shortcut that actually works and is a quick and efficient way to do something. Sometimes, these shortcuts don't work quite so well. I think the funny thing about this picture is the thing at the back which says our most valuable resource sits 63 feet ahead. And this is a good visual analog for a cognitive bias, which is it's a shortcut, but sometimes in the modern world, it doesn't actually help us to make the choices which are going to serve us best. Cognitive biases are, uh, have been named, revealed by behavioral scientists over the last 30 years. There's about 100 of them on Wikipedia. They sound some of them as if they've been invented by psychology students at a drinking game. The Texas sharpshooter fallacy, the IKEA effect, the kind of mysterious sounding von Restroff effect. We don't need to concern ourselves too much with these. Some of them don't relate directly to marketing. And as we love shortcuts, what I do with my clients most of the time is kind of simplify them into about eight separate groups. And I'm quickly going to talk about two of those today. The first, and that should read, losses matter more than gains. It's kind of funny how football coaches or sports coaches have got this great insight into human behavior. Bill Shankly, the manager of Liverpool, used to say, Football is not a question of life or death. It's more important than that. And uh, Sparky Anderson, who was a baseball coach and not a behavioral scientist, used to say, losing hurts twice as bad as winning feels good. And Sparky Anderson was right on the money because a raft of behavioral science experiments show that the psychological Im impact of losing $100 is about twice as big as the positive psychological impact of gaining $100. And this is an interesting insight for marketers, because so often, marketers want to talk about what people will gain from their product. Yet actually, to understand the, how losses affect our choices is a really important thing. I talked about weird, this Western, educated, industrialized, et cetera, researching. Here is an example, which is unfortunate for that. It was done at grocery stores in the Washington, D.C. region. There's actually, given that many of the people from the United States live in the Washington, D.C. region, it's quite likely that many of you were unlikely uh, subjects in this research. Um, but what this research did was to look at three stores set up in different ways. In the first set of stores, they just simply measured how many people used reusable shopping bags. And they saw it came out about 13%. In the second set of stores, they gave them a five cent incentive for bringing a reusable bag. And in the third set, they gave them a five cent tax if they didn't bring the reusable bag. Now, it's kind of interesting. Five cents to most people in the US isn't very much. This study is actually called the effect of small incentives on behavior. And what we see is, with the five cent incentive, that 13% jumps up to 15.4%. Not really a great increase. But when they looked at the stores where there was a loss frame, where people were being taxed for not bringing their bags, anybody want to take a guess as to what it went up to? 30, I heard. Yeah? You're pretty close. 44%. This is a five cent incentive. And it just shows the power that the prospect of a loss can have upon us. You know, marketers sometimes do this. I don't know if you remember this. You won't remember this campaign, but from the folklore of it, IBM in the 60s and 70s was the powerhouse of computing. Nobody touched them. And they kind of, you know, they could have gone out making all sorts of claims about how they made corporations better and organizations better. But actually, the sort of the line that their salesmen used and the line that was associated with them was not about what you might gain by using IBM, but was this. Whoops. No one ever got fired for buying IBM. Again, addressing that prospect of loss. They knew the prospect of getting fired as a loss was more powerful than the prospect of even perhaps getting promoted. 
I think Apple is an interesting case. So Apple um, ran this advertising. Some of you will have seen it. Very inspirational advertising. It was here's to the crazy ones. They had a raft of people. They had um, um, Nelson Mandela. They had, um, I'm, as I say that, I'm forgetting the names of all of the people that they had. But they took all of these great iconoclastic and exceptional people and used them as examples of how to think different. Now, Actually, I don't think Bob Marley, Albert Einstein, or any of them ever used an Apple computer, but that's not really <laughs> the point. But actually, so they did this, and they appealed to really people who were emotionally quite likely to buy Apple computers. But when they wanted to break into the mainstream PC market, they didn't talk about thinking different. They did this. And could you play the commercial? Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. What's with the big boy clothes? Oh, this, uh, yeah, I just got back from a meeting, so. Why? Why were you at a meeting? Yeah, Why? I do work stuff, too. Come on, I've been running Microsoft Office for years. Microsoft Office work stuff. Oh, boy. Well, oh, I knew this day would come. PC. I just need to sit down. Oh, wow. There's plenty of work out there for both of us. I don't know why you're acting like this. Why go on? Just let me lie here and depreciate. Uh. So rather than telling people to think different, they were really saying to PC owners, think the same. We do the same as a PC does, because they realized that really the problem for PC users switching to Mac was the prospect of losing the things that a PC did. And that's what they addressed throughout that campaign. You know, um, Kumi talked about something yesterday, for any of you who weren't here. He talked about how in a community in Southern Africa, the local government decided that they would provide water close to the village so that the people didn't have to walk down to the river to get it. They put in pipes and taps. And he talks about sort of how they found that the taps kept getting stolen. And one of the interesting things, I think, looking at this from the perspective of loss, is that what was happening was that the people who were benefiting from that water going in their pipes into their houses were losing something. So they had a gain, which was convenience in getting water, but they lost the social interaction of being able to go down to the river and talk to people. And that was his belief as to why that program failed. Now, to make that succeed, perhaps what the people who implemented the program should have done is actually understood what was going to be lost and created a substitute for it, created another social occasion so that people weren't losing that interaction with the new intervention. Um, Another interesting and somewhat counterintuitive example I think that affects all our worlds is how people are not really, all of us, are not so good about making choices that actually sort of give us benefits in the future. And I don't just say the people we seek to influence with programs, but we all know that. We have all made promises to go to the gym and not kept them, to not take that second slice of chocolate cake and taken it, to eat salad for lunch on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, to not drink during the week or whatever it is, yet we find it hard to do it. And, you know, to a large extent, we are short-term creatures. Um, humans have an irrational preference, behavioral economists tell us, for a smaller reward now over a larger reward in the future. And one of the things I often do when I'm talking at conferences is I, I bring out a 50-pound note or a $50 note, and I say to people, do you want this now? Or I have a $100 note, and I say, do you want this in a year's time? Which one do you want, the $50 now, the $100 in a year's time? And sort of what happens is people say, oh, $50 now. And about three quarters of people say they want the $50 now, which actually fits with, 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 with what um, behavioral scientists have found in research. Now, what's interesting is I then explain to people that by forsaking that $100 in a year's time, they're forsaking an interest, a rate of return of 100%, which is about five times what Bernie Madoff was offering people. Yet people are drawn to take the reward now, the smaller reward now. And there's a very interesting study from a field called neuroeconomics that actually gives us some insight as to why this might be. This research was done by a guy called Hal Hirschfield when he was at Stanford. He's now at UCLA. And what he did was he had people lie in an fMRI machine that measures where blood is going to in the brain and gives us an indication of what parts of the brain are being used for certain tasks. And what he did was he had people, oops, he had people think about their present self, future self, present other, and a future other. And that little yellow dot there at the back of the brain is the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. And that's a part of the brain that's believed to be associated with concepts of self, self-awareness. If you hear advice that relates to self, you might see activity in that part of the brain. Now, given there's four sets, two of them are about present, two of them are about future, two are about self, 
to her about others, you might expect that you get two lines going one way and two lines going another way. But you can see from the graph, that's not the case. We have an outlier. Now, the interesting thing about the outlier, and I will tell you what it is, the outlier is present self. But what's interesting is not so much that the outlier is present self, but the line underneath it is future self. And in terms of neural activity, future self looks much more like thinking about another person than thinking about yourself. And this, to me, is a very, very interesting insight and explains to some extent, perhaps, why we find it difficult to take actions that benefit us in the future. Because actually, we're doing it for someone else. Why should I put that money in my, in my retirement plan rather than spend it on something nice for me now, when really my brain is telling me that's kind of someone else. You're giving that money to someone else. And there's an interesting, some marketers have actually managed to do something with this. Um, this, is a, <laughs> this is something that Merrill Edge have done in the US, where they, 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 when you go and get on their uh, retirement planning site, the, your webcam takes a photograph of you and ages your face. Now, I took this about four years ago, and I think I probably look as old as that now, <laughs> even though that is meant to be me when I'm aged 107. And what they found, and how Hirschfeld found in his research when he did similar experiments, is that if you show people an image of themselves a few years ahead, then actually they will, are more likely to make decisions that will benefit them in the future. Because what you're doing is closing that gap between present self and future self. Um, here's an example from our office in Brazil. If, uh, if it's difficult for most of us to take actions that benefit our future, it's also really difficult for kids. And um, what they were trying to do was encourage kids to use sun cream at the beach. But the problem is kids want to go off and play. It's much more in the moment. It's kind of the immediate gratification is doing something now. Um, and it's kind of a, a bit of a pain in the butt to sort of have your mum slather sun cream all over you. Um, so what we did for Nivea was we developed these dolls that were made of um, ultraviolet light sensitive plastic. So when these dolls were left out in the sun for any more than a minute or so, they sort of started to go red. Here is one, unless you put sunblock on them. So you put sunblock on the doll and she doesn't get sunburned. If you don't put sunblock on, you get somebody who's got a round red face rather like mine. But the great thing about this was that it took this thing with long-term benefits, which is you know, painful sunburn in six hours' time or aging skin and skin cancer in 20 years' time, and really brought it home and brought it to the moment. I think it's a great example of something Dan Ariely talks about. He says that trying to get people, you know, sort of behavior change is often about getting people to do the right things for the wrong reasons. I mean, it wasn't the right reason to sort of play with a doll, but it got people into the behavior of putting sunscreen on. I think, you know, you can talk about doing the right things for the wrong reasons. There's been programs in the UK, for example, where people have been given cash incentives to take medicine. And I suppose it becomes an interesting point as to how wrong the wrong reason is. But I think if the behavior change you seek has long-term benefits, you need to find a short-term benefit and lead with that. And a couple of months ago, Antje Becker Benton sent me some really interesting work from Uganda, which I really liked, because it did just this. It took the long-term benefits of family planning, the long-term benefits of planning a small, manageable family for a better life, but made them really visceral in the day. It wasn't about you know, kind of saving for the future. It wasn't about sort of having a long-term better life. It was about Fred is broke, but Bernard has got loads of money. He's not. It was about what he had now. Here's another example from that campaign, which is in, in Lugandan. And you see Fred, who's got a sort of not very satisfying meal of sadza. And um, Bernard has got kind of pretty much a full meat grill there that he's tucking away at. But I think a great way of making that thing really, really visceral and in the moment, rather than sort of trying to sort of tell people about the long-term benefits of the behavior change. I think sort of these examples and perhaps some of the insights from behavioral economics allow us to do something. They allow us to understand how human nature shapes people's choices. And that's really, really important because what it means you can do is create choices that align with how the brain naturally works. And the benefit of that gets us to 
you know, allowing you to make the behavior change you need a natural choice. And I think, you know, because I'm in marketing, I would say this, that really helps because we are all ultimately in the business of choice. So thank you very much. I hope we have some time for questions.